some of our kids, I don't know how many, but some of our kids today are playing this. It's like a Bible bingo or something. It's a sheet of paper. It helps them stay engaged in what's going on in the sermon because it'll be different words or different phrases they got to be listening for and check off. So as uh, fate would have it or providence would have it, there were like a half a dozen things that I wasn't going to say. <laughs> so now in my... <laughs> In my uh, historically uncreative way, <laughs> I'm going to insert some of those words. So you say, well, that's even odd. <laughs> that's why. Anyhow, you got your Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to read this text. All right. This is uh, 26 through 38. This is actually the angel coming to Mary and announcing that she will conceive and give birth to the Son of God, give birth to Jesus. Verse 26 says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and a virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month which with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Lord, again, we're thankful, grateful for your word, grateful to be here, grateful, Lord, to give ear to what the Spirit is saying to each of us and what the Spirit's saying to the church. Lord, thankful that, Lord, we don't have to be kind of creative and unique around this time of the year, but Lord, we can can present things as they are. Lord, the, the same old truth, the same old story. But, Lord, it falls with fresh power, and I pray that it would do that today. I pray, Jesus, that your spirit would rest upon me and that you would help me, Lord, to handle your word well, and your word would accomplish your desire. Amen. So, Christmas is about God, and it's about the Son. Typically, um, whether rightly or wrongly, approaching Christmas and at the Christmas time, You will hear stories about wise men who seek him, about shepherds who stood in awe of him, about a star that led people to him, about Bethlehem, a city made famous by him. But see, it's all about him. It comes back to all about him. And the Christmas story and everything leading up to it, the scripture says is good news for all people. As I said to the group that was gathered here last night, it's for it's for the poor who know they're poor and in need. It's for the rich who think they don't need anything. It's for everyone that's in between. It's from the it's for the hurting and for the well, it's for the broken and it's for the whole. It's for the lonely person whose heart aches to have some kind of real and genuine relationship. It's for the married couple whose marriage has just grown distant and difficult through the years. It's for the person whose life has been diminished, quality of life has been diminished by hurt or injury or illness. It's for the brokenhearted. It's for those that have lost a loved one and they're just not around anymore and they're grieving for that. Christmas is for the, the girl, now perhaps a woman, whose dad never told her that she was beautiful. It's for the boy, the guy, maybe a man now, whose father never told him that he was loved. Christmas is for the adulterer, looking for love and approval in all the wrong places. Christmas is even for the liar, the cheat, and even the murderer. It's for every sinner 
that needs forgiveness. The Christmas story is, is good news for all people. Sinner, saint, good, bad, uh, rich, poor. It's for all. Our passage of scripture today is going to draw attention to God. The passage of scripture we'll look at today shows God to be wise, to be gracious, and to be very, very strong. The kind of God that when you leave here today, if you believe it, it's the kind of God that you can rest in, kind of God that you can trust, kind of God you can come to and find forgiveness for your sins. God's wise, his wisdom, first of all, what stands out to me in the Christmas story and the events approaching it, the passage we have today, God's wisdom is first and foremost shown in his plan and purpose to save lost sinners. You know, right here in the text, the Bible says in verse 31, it says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Well, Jesus means Savior. Jesus means God saves. Jesus means Jehovah saves. God's wisdom is seen in the fact that he sent a Savior. I mean, his purposes, his saving purposes are seen in a person, namely the Son. And as I pointed out last night, some of you will hear heard that. As I pointed out last night, the fact that God sends a Savior indicates that we need a savior and also indicates that we can't save ourselves all of us have sinned all of us fall short of the glory of God and none of us have the ability to save ourselves but God so loved the world that he sent his son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life when you look at the Christmas story God's genius and God's wisdom is seen first of all just in his plan and purpose to save sinners his love is seen in that too his wisdom is also seen in the events leading up to and including the first Christmas. I mean, when you read the scripture, you can see that there is plan and there is purpose and there is precision. There's nothing that happened by accident. Whether you read Luke 1, whether you read Matthew 1, whether you read Luke chapter 2, you can see the way this whole thing unfolds. This isn't just happenstance. This isn't just fate. This isn't just God kind of responding to situations. This is part of the divine plan from eternity past. God, de he decided and he uh, devised a plan and he executed the plan. The scripture says here in verse 26, this has always stood out to me. You know, this planning and execution and precision. The Bible says in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God in the sixth month. Now, this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, but he didn't send him in the third month. He didn't send the angel in the third month. He didn't send the angel in the fifth month. He didn't send the angel in the seventh month. He didn't send the angel in the eighth month or the ninth month or the second month. He sent him in the sixth month. So you say, well, big deal. That's just indicating it, it, it was what it was. No, the Bible says in the fullness of time, Galatians 4, God sent the Son. This was God's timing. This was God's plan. The sixth month was his plan. It wasn't just something that just happened. This was something all the way back in eternity past. in the sixth month. Elizabeth's pregnant, sixth month. That's when we begin to unpack this thing and unfold this thing. I'll tell you, you can trust God with timing. Uh, I know if you're like me, I mean, you know, you're praying for things, you're believing for things, and so often, I mean, God always comes through in one way or another, but so often it seems like he's kind of he's late on the scene. You can trust God's timing. He might be rarely early, but he's never late. He's always there. There is a time. There's a time for you. There's a time for your kids. There's a time for your grandkids. There's a time. There's a time. It's a six month. I mean, there was planning and precision here. This just wasn't happenstance. But then the scripture says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth. Now, let me put it this way. He's, he's delivering a message to a virgin by the name of Mary. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he goes to Nazareth. He knows where she lives. God wasn't in heaven trying to, you know, inquire of the angels. Remember, you know, we're going to do this. What is that? You know, what town you think we should do it in? What city? No, I'll tell you, from eternity past, it was going to be Nazareth. And, and, and you know what? He was going to have no trouble finding Mary because he knew exactly where she lives. Lived. Uh, you know what? God, God knows where you live. And I'm not, not just geographical location. He, he, he knows that, of course, but he, he knows exactly where you're at. He, he knows what's going on in your life. He knows exactly where you're at. He doesn't have anybody that needs to inform him, nor does he have to kind of figure out, I wonder what this person needs at this given point in time. You see, he, he knows what's the proper time for you. He knows what's the proper time for our church. He knows what's the proper time for your kids, your grandkids, your friends, your family. He knows what the proper time is, and he knows exactly where you're at. He doesn't have to track you down. And then the, the scripture goes on here, and it says, we're going to go to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He knew, he knew Mary's name. Well, guess what? 
I mean, I don't want to be glib about this, but you've got to let this sink in. He knows your name. He knows Ruth and Kitty and Scott and Roz, and he's not, you know, just got so much to do sustaining the universe. He doesn't forget your name. He, he's not uninterested in what's going on in your life. He's not a, a detached, distant God. Boy, he knows the time for you. He knows where you're at. He knows where you're living, and he knows your name. Your name's been on his lips from eternity past. He knew you before the foundation of the world. I'll tell you, the wisdom of God, the great and gracious wisdom of God is seen just simply in, in the way the events of the Christmas story and the events leading up to the Christmas story unfold. And I'll tell you, the wisdom of God, I think, is especially seen in the incarnation. Now, we understand the incarnation. Hopefully you do. It's this, that God took on human flesh. God became a man without ceasing to be God. I mean, this is one of the great mysteries of the faith, the dual nature of Christ. He was fully God, yet fully man. Two natures distinct yet in one person and inseparable and it, it al allowed for that's probably not the right word to use but it allowed for God to save sinners and do so justly and you might say well what do you, what do you mean by by that well see God's a just God and the sin that was committed against God guess who committed that sin against God Human beings, humanity. In fact, Adam st stood as a representative human being in the very beginning, the first Adam, and he sinned against God. For justice to be wrought properly, then the, the, the humans that sinned against God or, or the human that committed the sin against God, you know, the, the human, it had to be paid by flesh and blood. So Jesus, the Bible says, I mean, you just see this, Jesus became the second Adam or the last Adam, a representative head of a, of, of a new group of people. And what he did is he succeeded where Adam failed, but what he also did is he paid the price for our sin. He stood in our place, died on the cross as our substitute for our sin. But, you know, we have the God-man. It's sometimes hard for us to understand, but when, we, when we've sinned, we've sinned, it's not just, you know, some people might say, well, you know, I've never killed anybody, kidnapped anybody. I've never done this. I've never done that. You know, I've just done sort of little sins. There was a book written several years ago called Respectable Sins. <laughs> you know, I've only done the respectable sins. I haven't been real bad. But see, the issue never is how much you've sinned. It's not what, what you've done. The issue is always against whom you have sinned. And see, this is it. If you can let this just sink in a little bit. We've sinned. And all of us have sinned, and Adam sinned, against an infinitely holy God. So there's an infinitely holy God, and we're finite human beings. Our sin against an infinitely holy God has created this, we'll put it this way, infinite chasm between us and God. And all, all of our human effort can't fill that, can't bridge that. Justice demands that humanity pay for it, but deity is the only one that can span that. So we have the God-man. I mean, the incarnation just reveals the wisdom and ge genius of God. God's able to save, and he's able to save justly, and uh, he's able to save in a way that's best for you and glorifies his name. So, I mean, we just unpack this thing, and I, I could do much more with it, but it, it shows how wise God is. But also, in addition, it shows us that God is gracious. Look in verse 28, or, yeah, 28. It's talking about the angel that's dispatched to go to Mary. And it says, he came to her and says, says this to her. He says, greetings, O favored one. This, this idea of grace is the favor of God. In fact, I think a derivative of this word really is grace. Or this could be something like, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Um, uh, one who's found grace. Or one uh, that, that grace has found. God is Gracious, and the grace is seen immediately in his selection and choice of Mary. I mean, Mary was a poor, uh, young um, teenager. She lived in a pretty sparsely populated city at the time, not really a famous city, well-known city, yet God chose her. God selected her. And contrary to some of the things that you hear, you know, the Protestants go to one extreme, the Catholics go to the other extreme. The Protestants really don't give 
Mary some of the maybe honor that she deserves, the Catholics go to the, the other extreme and they, they want to communicate and say, wow, it's because she was such a wonderful you know, young lady that God chose her. The Bible doesn't substantiate that at all. God chose her and it spilled out of his own good, gracious well-being. That's how grace works. God doesn't choose you and love you and favor you because you're well-educated, because you have better intellect, because you have better looks, because you have better skills, because you have higher social status. That is, you know, the miracle of grace, and we see it with Mary, it ought to really give us all hope. The miracle of grace is God doesn't choose on any of those reasons. God doesn't favor us based on any of those reasons. In fact, if you read through the whole scripture, the Bible doesn't tell us any more about how God uh, distributes grace other than to say in Ephesians 1, in so many words, that it spills out of the innermost part of his being as his loving heart spills over in grace. So nobody sits there and says, wow. Boy, uh, you know what? God, God chose me because I was smarter. God chose me because I had more gift. God chose me because he knew what I could bring to the kingdom of God. You know, the Bible says actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that God chose in large part, not, ex not all the way, it says that he chose the base things. He says not many of you were, you know, not many of you were wise and not many of you had social status and not many of you were this. He doesn't say not any of you. So there's, there's, some, there's some real smart people to get saved. There's some real rich people to get saved. There's some people of very, very high social standing to get saved. But he says, you know what? When you look at the whole, I'm going to really paraphrase God here, Paul. When you look at the whole body of Christ, there's not many of you that way. In fact, most of you were, were bait. Most of you, nobody would have chose you. Most of you, when it came time to pick up the team, they wouldn't have picked you. But God doesn't choose the way we choose. So you know what? Grace is, is here and it's evident and ought to give us all hope, the favor of God that comes to us. But also we should know something about Mary. Grace is not a promise of a life of uninterrupted ease and, and blessing. It simply is not. I mean, think about Mary. Mary, for the rest of her life, lived under a certain cloud of suspicion uh, centered around the birth of her firstborn son. I mean, how many people believe this story? And I've often thought about it. I've often communicated here. You've probably often talked about it. I mean, it's just an incredible story. Mary gets visited by an angel. Mary becomes pregnant, you know, the, the, the conception by the Holy Spirit. I cannot imagine the conversation that took place between her and her parents. It, it doesn't seem reasonable to me to expect that her parents said, oh, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> no, it seems reasonable to, you know, her dad was, where's Joseph? I'm going to kill him. <laughs> well, then Joseph didn't believe her either. You know, Mary, it doesn't work this way, you know. Uh, it took an angel appearing to Joseph in order to persuade him that, yeah, in fact, this is, she lived under cloud of suspicion the rest of her life. Not only that, um, it seems very, very likely that Joseph died at some point where there were still children in the home, so she ended up being a single mom. And then, this is unimaginable to me, she was there and she witnessed the, the brutal execution of her oldest son. Brutal, unjust execution of her oldest son. Here's the thing. Grace doesn't mean the rest of your life is just going to be a life of ease and blessing. Grace says you can be forgiven. Grace says you can be enabled. Grace is enough for your sins. Grace is enough for your pain. Grace is enough. Boy, His grace is enough for your suffering. Grace is enough for the challenges you face in life. Grace is enough for the difficult marriage. Grace is enough for the wayward children. Grace is enough to give you peace and joy and hope. Grace is enough to bring you through. I'll tell you, that's the truth. You know, sometimes God changes things, and sometimes He just brings you through it. Sometimes God answers prayers exactly you want, the way you want Him to answer prayers, and sometimes He doesn't. Sometimes He just brings you through. Sometimes, you know, you get to get the thing moved out of the way. Sometimes He says you're going to have to go through that. That's just simply the way it is. But God's a good God. God's a gracious God. God's a wise God. He'll get you through, and He'll get you through for your good and for His glory. God's grace, His grace is sufficient. I mean, just think about it. Remember the Apostle Paul. I mean, we got the record of it in 2 Corinthians 12. I mean, Paul was, was a great man of God. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And Paul was plagued by something he calls a thorn in the flesh. The Bible doesn't see fit to tell us what that thorn was because, you know, <laughs> that way 
um, it, it applies to us all. We all can have, we could have, it could be a physical illness, it could be a demonic oppression, it could be people that's given, it, there's a whole wide array. But anyhow, it was bad enough for Paul that he says he implored the Lord, he prayed, and he implored the Lord to take this thing from me. And you know what God said to him? He said, my grace is sufficient. Wow. My grace is sufficient. I'll tell you. Uh, his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient to bring you through. His grace is sufficient to heal you. His grace is sufficient to bring you through when you don't get better. His grace is sufficient. God is wise and he's gracious. And you know what, too? God is also very, very strong. I mean, theologians, we use the word omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Although he doesn't use his power in some kind of an arbitrary, indiscriminate way. To say that God's omnipotent. Uh-oh. I, I went out for a second there, didn't I? You know? Yeah. God's, God's powerful enough for you to hear this message without amplification if need be. But to say that God's all-powerful is to say that he always uses his power in a way that advances his plan and purpose. And his plan and purpose is always a good plan and purpose. But God is very, very strong. And when you look at the text here, okay, the angel comes to Mary. We already know it. And uh, says, you know, you're going to give birth to a child. And she says, well, how can this be? Since I'm a virgin, I've never been with a man. This isn't, this isn't so much a question of some kind of doubt. She's just saying, like, how's this thing going to work? She didn't say, hey, I don't believe this. She just said, how, how can it be? And then the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, then what God does is he says this in verse 36. He says, behold, your relative Elizabeth, behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called ba barren. Uh, I've communicated to you guys in the past. Well, why does he all of a sudden introduce Elizabeth into this? Because he's telling Mary what's going to take place. And he's telling her this is going to be a miracle because that's the way. This has never happened before. Then he says, hey, put your head up a little bit. Look around you. There's Elizabeth. She was, the, she was in her old age. She was the one that was called barren. And now she's conceived and she's in her sixth month. You know what God or the angel was communicating on behalf of God to Mary? Was saying, you know what? Take a look around. There's miracles happening. Take a look around. There's not a, she, he says it to her explicitly in the next verse. There's nothing that's too difficult for God. Look at Elizabeth. Nobody ever thought she'd be able to have the She was long past childbirth. That wasn't difficult for God. There's nothing that's beyond God's reach. There's nothing that's too difficult for God. And you know what? Mary needed to see that right then. Mary needed to hear that right then, and she needed to hear the next verse in verse 37, where the scripture says this, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. And as I've pointed out, too, in the past, you know, when you're preaching the Christmas message 30 or 40 times, you find, you know, you just, you just got to go back to the story and you got to say the same thing over and over again. I was reading a blog piece two weeks ago by someone, uh, a, a respected minister, I really do, uh, I respect him a lot. And he says, pastors, don't try to get cute, don't try to get creative, don't try to, you know, say something new. He said, your people just got to hear the same old story. And he said, and besides, they're gonna, not going to remember what you said last year. So this isn't a repeat, but this is the same old story. And when you get to verse 37, the same old story is a good story. He said, nothing will be impossible. There's nothing. This, this has to, the, the, the no thing, the word there really is, it's, it's rhema, which is typically translated word. And what, what he's saying is, maybe we put it this way, is Mary, there's no word that comes from God that lacks the requisite power to accomplish its desire or its end. In other words, there is no word that God speaks that lacks the power to bring it to fruition. There's no word that God gives you that lacks the power to bring it to fruition. There's nothing that God says to you that lacks power to see it come to the end that God prescribed for it. There is nothing too difficult for God. There's nothing that beyond God, that's beyond God's reach. I'll tell you, that kid you've been praying for, that son, that daughter, it's not impossible for them to get rich. It's not impossible for them to be reconciled 
to you. It's not impossible for them to get healed. You know that mom or that dad you've been praying for? It's not impossible for them. You know, the, you know you've been struggling in your career and your job and things like that. You know what? It's not impossible for God to move you along and move you up or move you to a no, new place. There's nothing impossible for God. You know that diagnosis the doctor gave you, and it, it really sounds bad. There's nothing impossible with God. God's able to heal. God's able to deliver. God's able to set free. God's able to recognize. Reconcile. God's able to save to the uttermost. You know that sin that you committed? You know that hardly anybody else knows about? And you just can't, you can't get by it, and you can't get by the guilt, and you, you try to work to make up for it? Well, guess what? There's no sin that God can't cover and forgive. There's nothing that's impossible for Him. There's nothing that's beyond His reach. There's no prayer that's too big. I, I have thought, you know, Often, there's two things that I've thought about prayer. In fact, I've revised myself in the last three or four years about prayer. You know, I got to a point where I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't pray for what I called little things. And I think that was wrong because God likes childlike faith. And by little things, I know some of you are going to get mad at me. But, you know, I, got, I was like, you know, I'm not paying, paying, praying for parking spaces. and I'm not doing that. You know, that just seems dumb. And I, I'll never forget. I, I know exactly when it happened. It was, um, it was in February, and a guy that, that was in, in our church was in critical condition. His name was George Kinsler, and I had to go over to Philadelphia. I knew where I was going to park, and um, I usually, especially when I go to Philadelphia, I bring my little car because it's just easier getting in spots, especially these darn parking garages where they just don't give you enough space. But I had my Buick, and I had to get there because it was an emergency, and I'm driving, and uh, you know, I'm getting near the parking garage. I say, God, just give me a spot. I said, I, I need a spot, and it needs to be close. You know, and it needs to be big enough for the car. I am telling you, honest to goodness, I went down into that. It, it, it's just down the street from Jefferson. I went down into that. I came through. You know, you go through, you get your thing. I came through right there, right there. Big, fat, wide spot. So I'll tell you, you know, you can pray for the dumb little things. But then I think what we do is we don't, we, we kind of pray more kind of in this middle ground, and then we don't pray for the big things. It's just too much for God. Boy, we can't limit God. Let's pray for the big stuff. Let's pray for the person we think will never get saved. Let's pray for the international situation that we think is out of control. Let's pray for those things, and let's believe that God, God's interested in them, and it's not, a, it's not a big thing for God to undertake and do that. So here's what I guess I urge you. There's nothing that's impossible with God. So that has to do with the little things. I just, I came to the conclusion, you know, that this idea of childlike faith. He's not talking about childishness, but I mean, I can be childlike, you know, Dad, Father, you know, I could really use that. You know, if you don't give it to me, I'm not going to get upset about it, but I could really use that. That'd be really helpful to me at this point. So if you would, but then also praying for the big things. You see, there's, there's nothing that's impossible with God. There's nobody beyond reach. There's nothing that he can't make whole. Um, I'll tell you. God, well, God's good, right? And God's wise, and God's gracious, and there's nothing that he can't do. But you've got to understand this also. See, I can just talk to you because this is all family kind of here today. That doesn't mean he's going to do what you ask him to do. That doesn't mean he's going to answer you the way that you want him to answer you. What it does mean is, is this, is God's going to do what ultimately and finally is best. See, because cause the all-wise God, he always knows what is the very best thing. And the Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. So you can't judge that just by the way you look at things. You have to trust God. He's not always going to do things exactly the way you want. He's not going to always answer prayers the way you want. But I can tell you this is God's always going to do the right thing. God's always going to do the good thing. God's always going to do the thing that in the end works for your highest good and his greatest glory. And you can rest in that because he's good and he loves you. And that's just simply what he does. And there's nothing that's beyond him. There's nothing that causes a panic for him. And there's nothing that he doesn't oversee and can't work it straight and can't move forward. So then finally we get in this text and I guess, wow, you know what? I, too, I just thought of something. See, I'm just having some random thoughts here this morning. You know, the, the Bible does say in Romans 8, talks about all these different things and even all these different difficulties. And it says in all these things, it doesn't just say we triumph. I mean, it's really neat the way uh, prepositions used there. For, we overwhelmingly triumph. 
So whatever goes on in your life, even though he might not answer the prayer exactly the way you want it to, he might not do exactly what you're asking him to do. What the scripture says, for those who trust God, those who believe God, those who he loves, those who he favors, and he's placed his favor upon you, and he's grace, you will, in the, in the end, it's overwhelming triumph. Yeah. Paul said, it, it, it was a revelation for me in there in Romans 8. You overwhelmingly triumph. I said, God, how you overwhelmingly triumph. And it was a revelation for me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 when Paul said, look, this outer man is dying. The inner man is being renewed. And he said, this momentary light affliction. He said, this momentary light affliction. This is Paul, momentary light affliction. And he's got three shipwrecks. He's three times beaten with 40 stripes. He was stoned and left for dead. Everybody hated him for a period of time. Even the original apostles didn't want anything to do with it. He said, momentary light affliction. He said something, this is a, a paraphrase, is accruing for me. Oh, I'd say whatever trouble, whatever suffering, you're trusting God. He says, is accruing for me an eternal weight glory. Well, I don't even know what all that means, but you know what? He saw it, and I want to see it. An eternal weight of glory far beyond all compared. So whatever happens in this life, and however God brings you through in this life, and he will bring you through, and however God chooses to answer prayers in this life, and however God chooses to display his power and grace in your life, and whatever suffering you got to deal with, and whatever difficult times you got to deal with, and whatever, you know, sometimes you're going to have triumph, and sometimes you're going to have suffering. He says this, is this, this momentary light affliction? It's a, there's, there's something, I, I got this picture, it isn't exactly like this, but it's sort of, you know, it'll be like a pile of gold, and it's just building. That momentary light affliction, glory, 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 an eternal weight of glory. It's just far beyond all comparison. And then Mary, you know, in this, this incident with the angel, after God says, through the angel, nothing will be impossible with God, then Mary said, oh, this is great, behold. I am the servant of the Lord. You know, I was in Africa um, back in the late 90s and doing this teaching thing and all that. And I was meeting some just people that had some really powerful testimonies. And, you know, you're there in Africa and like, yeah, this guy, yeah, I planted 200 churches and this one's three. You know, they're doing these amazing things. And I'm teaching them, right? What a joke. But, well, you know, you get there and you're like, are you kidding me? This guy already, and they're, well, anyhow. This guy comes, he's this bishop, and he's really well regarded. And I, I'm meeting him because I'm just, I'm just used to the West, okay? You know, probably got a business card, bishop so and so. And and he said, I introduced myself, and he says, I am, My name is Daniel. I'm a servant of the Lord. <laughs> Jeez. There's Mary, mother of Jesus. I am the servant of the Lord. Talk about faith. Let it be to me according to your word. Whew. Boy, anybody ready to rest in that? Let it be to me according to your word. Amen. Amen. Uh, folks, you can, trust, you can trust the Lord. Boy, he is wise, he's gracious, he's powerful, he loves you, and he does good in your life. I'm not, a, I, I'm not even asking for any real outworking other than if you can say to the Lord, I'm a servant of the Lord. I am your, be it done to me according to your word. And rest in that, amen? amen. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Um, Lord, I, I, I am hopeful that I say on behalf of us all, Lord, here we are, servant of the Lord. We're your servant. Be it done to us individually. Be it done to us as a church community. Be it done to us according to your word. Help us, Lord, help us to be able to hear what the Spirit's saying to each of us individually. Help us to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church. And Lord, then help us to just be able to say, be it done to me according to your word. I'm a servant of the Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you're wise, much wiser than any of us will be. And, and sometimes we can't figure out your wisdom, and sometimes we think we know better. And I pray you forgive us for that and help us to rest and trust in your ways. And thank you that you've been gracious. There was nothing in us to commend us to you. There's no reason that you should have looked at us and said, wow, this looks like it would be a good asset. I'm going to save him. There was nothing at all that way. Lord, but you chose to save us anyhow and forgive us of our sins. And Lord, you've chose to display your power in us. 
and um, Jesus, even in this Christmas uh, season, um, and, and we reflect on the Christmas story, and we see even the wisdom, power, and grace of God displayed in baby Jesus in the manger. So, Lord, I pray for people here. I pray for tonight's service. I pray for souls to be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. In case you were wondering in that prayer, then it, it occurred to me as I was coming to a conclusion that I hadn't said baby Jesus, and that was on the bingo sheet. <laughs>